Good evening, welcome. E Courts Community Bible Church, Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. We left off with uh, half of verse 4 last week. We're going to continue from there. We didn't have any reading uh, this evening. Uh, but I'm going to take it one verse at a time. So if you open up to Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 4, and I'll open us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have to come together to study your word. The book of Revelation, help us in our understanding concerning this great chapter. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, this particular chapter is a historical chapter that goes all the way back in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, we're dealing with Satan as the dragon. It even will use the term serpent. And the first time we heard the word serpent was all the way back to Genesis in the Garden of Eden. So uh, that's how far this uh, historical section goes back. And then it comes up to the time of Israel's bringing forth the Christ child, prophecy of Genesis 3.15, Christ promised the seed of the woman is going to be the one who will come and destroy Satan and bring victory uh, to uh, believers in Christ. And, all, and, and also, Christ will reign for a thousand years. The book of Revelation brings us, uh, ties all the pieces together of uh, the 65 preceding books. And uh, it uh, ends with the, in the culmination with the kingdom on earth, God's kingdom on earth. This is important. Uh, 6,000 years uh, have taken place approximately since uh, Adam was uh, uh, created. And now we've come here uh, to the almost to the beginning of the millennium, but we're, we're looking, we're still seven years short, uh, meaning that uh, the Lord could come back at any time. We don't know, do we? Uh, but we do believe that the time is approaching uh, rapidly. So we're, we're seeing here that the woman mentioned in this chapter is Israel, and we know that uh, definitively from uh, Genesis chapter 37. Uh, take the time to read that and compare the scriptures uh, do a little homework, you'll, you'll agree with me, I'm sure. And then we're coming here to the place where Christ is going to be um, born and Satan now is waiting to devour Christ. Let's begin reading at verse 4. <clears throat> it says, And his tail, that is the red dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, that's the <coughs> fallen angels, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child. You don't want to stop right there and just a little comment. Where were the angels going to be, uh, the, the fallen angels going to uh, be uh, uh, fall to? The earth, not Mars, not Saturn. Uh, could they have ex existed there? Sure, because they don't need air like we do. The earth, and the earth we're gonna, we find throughout the scriptures is the, is the central focal point in the universe apart from uh, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is central, but the earth is also, the Bible says, is the place where uh, God's rest his feet. And uh, now we see here uh, in verse number four the, that these stars are cast to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be devoured for to devour her child as soon as it was born. I want you to think about this just a little bit more. And uh, what about uh, Christ? This is the Son of God who is being born. And I, I just think about the audacity, the brashness, that the impudence, that this created being, his name is Satan, is going to come and he's going to try to destroy the Son of God? I mean, we're, we, we spent some time uh, last week in Isaiah chapter 14 
and also in Ezekiel chapter 28, looking at how the Satan was created. His name was Lucifer in that day, which meant uh, light bearer. And then he fell, and his name was changed to Satan, uh, deceiver. And that's what he does today, he's deceiving us. He's deceiving the world. You see it through the news media. You see it through politicians. You see it through false Christians. I say false Christians, professing Christians, but false Christians. Deceit, deceit, deceit. That's his main influence today. Besides evil, of course. And so, now he's come to devour the Christ child. Let's read a little bit about the Christ child in verse 5. And she brought forth a child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So this is a, a quick history of Christ coming to the earth in the, in the incarnation, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. And uh, it says here, next thing you know, Satan wants to try to destroy Christ, uh, and he kind of accomplishes that. Maybe we'll talk about that with uh, almost with uh, King Herod because King Herod destroys all of the little babies that are uh, two years and under. Can you imagine that? We, we shake our heads and we say how atrocious, but wait a minute. We've done way worse than that in our abortion, 63 uh, million and around the world. I, I would presume about, you know, a billion and a half maybe of human uh, children, in, in, innocent little children. So this is what his goal is is to destroy as much of those created the image of Christ as he can. Of course, this is the Christ child. This is the one who created the, the uh, universe. What audacity a created being. So we're going we're gonna to learn about this uh, today just a little bit more. He did cast, a, cast them to the earth. With his tail, he brought the third part of the angels, the fallen angels, who willingly came. These, they, they weren't uh, taken by him. By force, they came with him. They desired him. He desired himself. Remember we read that in uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 21. He saw himself. He was uh, an amazingly created angel, uh, the, the top chair, the covering cherub, and uh, he fell out of pride. He fell because of pride. Now, uh, it says, The devil stood before the woman and was ready to deliver to be, uh, the, the child was ready to be delivered, for he wanted to devour the child as soon as it was born. Listen, I just want to uh, say this at this point, because the Bible has a lot to say about uh, Satan throughout history and what he, his, his objective goals are and what he's doing. And this is in the Bible, and uh, first I want to say this, we spoke about this last week. Those of you that were here, we spent some time on Satanology and we talked about this great foe that we're faced with. How can you and I face this, this creature? We can. We'll talk about that uh, also from 1 John chapter 4, right? Particularly. And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But God says this to the church in Matthew 6, 18. He says, He's speaking to Peter. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. We said this last time, this rock is Christ. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Now in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, and actually um, I prayed this, uh, that this whole section from Ephesians chapter 6, but verse 12, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of darkness, of this world against spiritual wickedness. Where? High places. High places. So we see the political authorities of this world and we uh, are just totally uh, amazed at what they get away with and how that they're all wrestling for power. And, uh, but wait a minute, we don't have the strength, but, but Christ does. And uh, uh, the Bible says, put on uh, the uh, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, and I prayed that this morning, and I try to pray it as often as I can. I think we need to pray this prayer every morning. This is from Ephesians chapter six. Put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against this creature. We 
We said also, James chapter 4, verse 6. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Verse 7 says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Verse 8, it says, draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. Is that enough? It is enough. As long as you are spirit-filled. Now, this isn't any exception for the believer. This is the... Uh, uh, our, our everyday experience it should be our everyday experience to walk in the spirit. Either you're walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. If you're walking in the spirit, you have the spiritual armor. You cannot stand against Satan and his foes except that you're in the spirit. So you wake up in the morning, you confess your sins. You make sure you are in fellowship with God. He will what? Fill you with his spirit. Now, our wait a minute. We already have the spirit. The Holy Spirit will fill us. That's walking in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Alright, so as we come down a little bit further here, uh, I want to uh, mention this, is that as Satan is revealed here, uh, we see in the Old Testament uh, passages, uh, such as Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 38, that he, 28, he uses king. And today, of course, it would be presidents, it would be uh, uh, rulers of countries, and, and some kings. But such is the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, 1 through 11. Okay, uh, Satan used the king of Babylon, uh, and he was the first major world power mentioned here in the times of the Gentiles. This is where the times of the Gentiles began, was around 605 B.C., and Israel was conquered, and as a result of that, from that time, all the way up until the um, end of the tribulation period of the times of the Gentiles. And its first reigning kingdom is Babylon, but hang on, who is the king? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, who's influencing this king? Satan. All right, we, we read that because in Isaiah chapter 14, 1 through 11, it starts off talking about King Nebuchadnezzar or the king of Babylon. And then we go into terminology that speaks about uh, Satan. It's, it's very clear and, and about his beginning and how he felt. Then you have the king of Tyre, Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. And it's worth our reading. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Now, uh, listen carefully. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. It starts out speaking about the king. So you would be thinking here, wow, this is some great individual, but actually uh, Satan uses powers, uh, political powers, to uh, advance his agenda. He, it's, his de it's his desire to rule the entire earth, to set up his own millennium. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, now listen, in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12, it says, uh, first of all, 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, or Tyre. Either, either word is correct. And saying to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou seest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Now wait a minute, you know that the, there isn't any individual the Bible's going to say that they are perfect in beauty, that they're full of wisdom, and uh, that this is how you can describe a human being. So this terminology now, I'm speaking about the, the king of Tyre, is actually who, uh, it's Satan, and he's using the king of Tyre. He's using the kingdom of Tyre. In fact, this king was Eth Baal, and uh, this was the king of Tyre. By the way, Baal, right? Baal worship Satan. And so Eth Baal, and so, Individuals lend themselves over to Satan. Hitler lend himself over to Satan. Great ruling powers lend themselves over to Satan. I also say that, you know, in the many cities, the demons try to uh, take advantage of people who will, uh, because, and, and, and most people fall because of what? Uh, because of the lust for money, uh, lust for... Uh, uh, sexual uh, prowess and also uh, for power. Uh, we, 
we, we've seen that with uh, different mayors in this city, uh, particularly uh, one that uh, we had to fight against. We knew we weren't fighting against this mayor. And I'm not talking about the present mayor, I'm talking about years ago. We've been here 42 years, you figure it out. But uh, the point was, was that Satan, we, Satan manifested himself and uh, while we were uh, in our building process after the fire that took us 13 years because we were hindered. Sounds like a, a chapter out of the book of Daniel. Uh, 13 years we were hindered by demonic forces. Individually, individually, each of us, you can be sure if you're a Christian, you will be uh, hindered by demonic forces. Okay, uh, last week I said, that there are some pastors who says, oh, I won't teach passages like this because every time we do, Satan does come and he attacks individuals. I don't know what happened to you this past week or if you figured that something, you know, you might have gone through certain trials or somebody, somebody else did. I have to quote this verse to tell you once again, and I, I told you I would. 1 John 4, 4. What does 1 John 4, 4 say, somebody? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, verse 4 starts this way. You are of God, little children. Don't run. Don't hide. Don't be afraid. It's the first uh, instinct that we have would be to fear. You know why? Because we don't want to suffer. Uh, but the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the trial of your faith were good. Of faith worketh uh, 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 patience and patience proof. So the point is, listen, is that uh, there is nothing that we need fear if we are, if God is first in our life. So what does the verse say? First John uh, chapter four. Start with verse uh, four. The first one. You are of God, little children. And it says here, uh, and have overcome them, the forces of evil, the demons, through Christ. Are you listening? Because greater is he that is, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We don't need to run. We also need to understand that any type of ruler or political ruler or influence of this world that will come after us, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We can still pray for them. We should still pray for them. How? For conviction in their life. We're going to be offered uh, different uh, uh, enticements, put it that way, in order to take detours. You know, there'll be some within the true congregations, like we said in our message last Sunday, that there's going to be those that are sheep and goats. And the goats, some of them are going to come on in. And they're going to hear certain things, and boy, they're going to go, and they're going to inform uh, our adversaries, uh, leaders of darkness. And uh, then we'll have to face some sort of uh, suffering, as uh, Paul did, the first century Christians, and thereon, anyone that stood up for Christ. I'm taking some time here, because right here in this passage here, we see that Satan is coming against Christ. And do you remember in when we were in the book of Revelation chapter uh, 2 and we were talking about the uh, church at Smyrna, the, the church that went under persecution, God found, uh, Jesus didn't speak of any faults in that church, the church at persecution. You know why? Because they gave up everything for Christ. There were no faults in that church. Well, it says, and, and by the way, it says, and you shall be, and you shall suffer you should be persecuted 10 days. Okay, what does that mean? Well, commentators throughout history have said that we don't, you know, they, they've come up, does this mean 10 years? Does this mean, you know, 10 eras? Does this mean, what does it mean? Well, you know, we can't know for certain and throughout history, I don't, I don't know that you can find a time, no one's found it yet that I'm aware of, but that what that tells me, and I think that on the surface, what that tells us is that whatever we have to go through, that trial is limited. <laughs> you're going to go through persecution, you're going to go through suffering 
10 days. Churches firm. So that whatever we have to go through, just remember this. God is with you, and God will not allow you to be tried above that which you are able, but will with the trial make a way for you to escape so that you can bear up under it. He's not going to allow it to be overwhelming. It may be His will to take your life, but no one can take your life. Satan himself can't take your, your life except that it's in God's plan. And the two prophets are the example of the last chapter that we were reading in chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. It says that it was because their testimony was finished. That's why the beast was able to take their lives. But remember this, three and a half days later, God raised them publicly in front of everyone. But it said the only reason they were allowed to take their lives, it was their appointed time. Same with you. It's the same with me. We need to know these truths. We need to apply these truths to our lives. We need to know that uh, we need, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we should what? Fear no evil. We should fear any evil. We should not fear any suffering. We should not fear any trial that we have to go through. Now, Satan would like to use that as a means to defeat us and that's why we've been saying at this church, whatever we're wrestling against, it's not against human beings. Okay? If, 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 the, if, the, if the mayor and his group, in the days that we went through what we went through at this church, and the Lord taught us uh, uh, how, you know, uh, uh, these trials would help us to understand how to grow in the faith. But this could have been a different person. It wouldn't have mattered. Because it was Satan's time. And so this is what, it, this is what it's going to be like in the last days. So uh, Satan is going to come against us. He's going to use political leaders. He's going to use powers of the world. I'm talking about the church. And this is before the tribulation, friends. Okay, this is during the tribulation. This is before. Because remember, this was the king of Babylon, Isaiah 14, 1 through 11. Then you have the king of Tyre, which we're looking at in Ezekiel chapter 28. And I said, verse 12, and I'm going to read it again. Son of man, take up a lament. Lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and that was Ethbaal, was the king in that day. And saying to him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, full of beauty. And then here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, the evidence here that actually is not directly speaking about the king of Tyre. That's just the, the figurehead here. Look at verse 13. Thou hast been in... Eden, the garden of God, King of Tyre was never there, but the person who possessed this political leader uh, definitely is Satan. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering. So we see that. Now remember this, we're talking about our situation. If we're believers, then what do we have to do? We have to put on the armor of God. When? Oh, you know, uh, whenever the pastor's teaching about that particular subject, then I think that, uh, yeah. Or maybe I'll memorize the verses. Memorizing the verses is not, uh, um, is not uh, putting on the armor. You can't put the armor on. The armor won't fit if you have sin. And so you're out, you're fending for yourself, and you won't last two seconds. Uh, but the moment that you yield right away, boy, 1 John 1, 9, right? 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we're liars, and the truth is not in us. But then it says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful. What do we have to do? Confess our sin. You know, that's homiligeo. It's agreeing with God. And by the way, repentance that begins at salvation continues throughout the Christian's life. It's an attitude of repentance. Because we always see ourselves as uh, weak uh, and as sinful as far as limited in who, in, in, in who we are in our flesh and who we are. And that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from this body of sin? Then he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And then I like to follow that through because it's in the same uh, 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 breath that he says in verse 1 of chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. No judgment. And can I say this? It's the same as saying no wrath. Because 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, God tells us 
uh, that uh, through Paul the Apostle, I have not appointed you to wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath. Jesus took our wrath upon himself. He took our sins upon himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And there was an exchange that was made at the cross because if you're genuine and real, you were transformed spiritually. And as a result of that, we have his righteousness. And so if we stumble or we sin, what do we have to do? Confess that sin. And then it says he is what? Faithful. And confession is not getting on the merry-go-round and saying, okay, I'm going to mouth these words and I'm just going to go back in my life and I'll come back next Sunday and I'll confess it again and I'll do it again and again. That's not confession. That's not true. Confession means, homilageo means agree with. It's the, the same heart as God has. And if that happens in your life, then He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You now are walking in the Spirit. You now are being filled with the Spirit. The Bible tells us, um, be not drunk with wine which is in excess, but be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Yield to God. All right. Uh, we've got the King of Babylon, and that's Isaiah 14, and we see the terminology that is used starts with Nebuchadnezzar. Then we've got uh, the King of Tyre, Ezekiel 28 and 12, and we see that that uh, person is called Eth Baal, and it wasn't him because he wasn't in the Garden of Eden. This was, this was Satan that was there. Now hang on. And then we go to Daniel chapter 13, Daniel chapter 10, and I'd like to read uh, briefly. Daniel chapter 10 and verse number 13, if you will. Now here's what it says. Uh, we're not just speaking about, this is, these are more examples. We're not just talking about the king of Babylon. We're not just talking about the king of Tyre. But the Bible is filled with individuals that Satan indwelt, that Satan used, and he's using today, by the way, friends. Um, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, uh, but you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to start with verse 5, if you will. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked at... This is Daniel speaking. I lifted up mine eyes. Daniel 10 and 5. And behold, behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of, of uh, euphos. Now, uh, this individual that we're speaking about is actually an angel that's appearing. It's like in the previous chapter when Gabriel appeared to Daniel. Gabriel, Daniel was praying, is it time, Lord? Is it time? And Gabriel came through and he answered Daniel's prayer. And uh, now we've got another angel. This is a different angel. And he says, I lifted up mine eyes and I looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphos. Then we go down to verse 11. And I think this is interesting because Daniel was a man of prayer. If we don't know anything else about Daniel, we know that he was a man of prayer. He got in trouble because he prayed so much. Read the book of Daniel. He got in trouble with the world. But it says this, He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. And if Daniel was a man greatly beloved, listen carefully. If he was a man of prayer, he was also faithful. He was also obedient. But his day began in the, in early in the morning, like Christ did in prayer. Then in the middle of the day he prayed. Then in the evening he prayed. He prayed towards Jerusalem. He prayed at the window. He was on his knees as he prayed to God. The Bible calls him a man greatly beloved. That means that gives you and I a chance to be loved in a greater way by God. Remember the verse, John 14, 21? He that hath my word, he it is that loves me. He that hath my word, he that keeps my word, my commandments, that's the person that loves me. And he will be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will give, I will manifest myself to that man. This is Daniel here. This was David who wrote how many of the Psalms? 73 of the 150 Psalms? Asaph. Men that loved God, that God came down. And here's what he said to Daniel. And quickly, verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, greatly beloved. Would, what would you think that if an angel came and told you that God says, 
James, you are a man greatly beloved. Put your, place your name in. Let's be like Daniel. It says, understood the words that I speak unto thee, and I stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. I've been sent right to you. And when he spoke these words unto me, I stood trembling. You know, when God is present through an angel, then it will cause us certainly a reverent fear. We'll be shaking. We'll be down on our face. Verse 12, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand. And watch this out. Watch this. And to chasten thyself before God. We know that God chastens us, right? Aren't we glad he does? We don't, we, we don't, uh, chasing for the meantime is grievous, but it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12. But we are to chasten ourselves, meaning that we are to deny ourselves certain things. We are to deny ourselves the things of the world, deny ourselves uh, going to places that the world goes to that are evil or against God. All right, uh, so he says, from the first day, uh, it says, which was spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And Daniel, then he said unto me, fear not, Daniel, for the, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God. Boy, he's down on his knees every day, three times a day, isn't he? His heart makes him do that, by the way. God didn't say, oh, you've got to be down there three times. His heart, our hearts, friends. Um, thy words were heard. I am come for <coughs> thy words. Does God answer prayer? Of course he does. Now, it's not always the same way that we want to hear that prayer answered. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says yes. But sometimes he said, guess what? You're going to have to wait. And at the church at Smyrna, you're going to have to wait 10 days in that one particular trial that they were going to face. Now, I faced trials for years. And some people have to face trials for decades. But the, the, the good news is this, is that God, look at uh, John, was it uh, John Bunyan? He wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Well, Twelve years in prison. But he got the second most read book in the world because of his 12 years in that prison. It was all about the life of a Christian, of a young Christian, finding Christ, going through what he had to go through to find Christ and live for Christ. Twelve years, friends. And you know what? I'm sure that he would have said, uh, if I had the choice to miss those twelve years, but I wouldn't have written this book under that, uh, under those conditions, I would not, I'd still want to go to, uh, I, I would want to go to prison. Okay, for Christ. And then here's the verse, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, uh, what? This angel here is saying that I couldn't get through because there was the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Are you kidding? A human being? I don't care how many physical weapons they have. They can't stop an angel. They can't stop, stop the weakest angel. Uh, I think it's Dr. David Barnett says there's seven levels of the angels. I can think of different ones. I can't think of all seven right now. But the point is, is that even the weakest angel there isn't any king on earth that could withstand against an angel. And so this prince of per Persia here is somebody, once again, like the king of Babylon, the king of Tyre, who was possessed or used, who, who yielded himself uh, to Satan. Watch what it says. And the prince of the king of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. And you know what had to happen? Michael had to come. Who's Michael? He's the archangel. He, chief angel. That's what that word arch means. The chief angel, and it says, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with, with the kings of Persia. So there, there's a spiritual warfare going on right now in the heavens. And there was a spiritual warfare going on there. And it is God's angels versus uh, Satan's angels. And some of Satan's angels are so powerful that they can stop some of God's angels, but they can't stop Michael. <laughs> the chief angel. So God said, maybe I better send you, Michael. And he went, and of course, he got the message through to Daniel. 
Okay. But when Michael faces Satan himself, which is kind of like an equal uh, power, kind of like, uh, he doesn't say, uh, I rebuke you, Satan. He says, the Lord rebuke you. So he doesn't duke it out with his own strength to prove how powerful that he is. He says, the Lord rebuke you. What should we learn from this? If Michael said, the Lord rebuke you, we should learn that ourselves. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, when he comes up against us. And by the way, he comes up possibly every day, but there are times that he, he comes in, into our lives. Are you listening? And he torments us. He torments us. He tormented Paul the Apostle, we read in the scriptures. But the fact of the matter is, and, 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 and again, Paul felt, he said, I, de I despair of life. So does that found, sound familiar with any of you? Despairing of life at times. Paul did. And he's the great apostle Paul. And yet, he stayed true to God. He was faithful to God. And uh, I want to close this out here in verse 20. It says, then, of Daniel chapter uh, 10. And it says, then he said, he knowest thou wherefore I am come and I will now return. This is not Michael. This is the, one of these angels. I... I will not, after he's answered uh, Daniel's uh, uh, prayer request and God has sent him, he says, now, he says, I will return, this is verse 20 of Daniel 10, I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. There's a fight going on. I'm going to return to that battle. It's God's angels. It's Satan's angels. Have you ever heard this before? All you got to do is read in the scriptures. Listen. If there's an angelic fight going on in this universe right now, and it's between God's angels and, and Satan's angels, but listen to this, remember, we learn in this passage, and it's important we learn this in this passage, one-third of the stars were pulled by Satan's tail out of heaven, figurative language. One-third of the angels were pulled, and of course, uh, the angels went voluntarily. But you know what that means? Two-thirds are left. Two-thirds are left. So this, this battle that's going on, you know, if, if we could have some history, if there was a book written on angelology that could uh, teach us of what has been happening historically in this uh, universe uh, in a different dimension, it would be a fabulous, fascinating, exciting, uh, you know, kind of like a, a spiritual Star Wars. Uh, but here we see... As soon as I got this message through to you, they need me back in Persia. I'm on my way. Something's going on right now in this world, in this universe. Satanic uh, uh, battle between the good angels and the false angels. And in Jude chapter, uh, Jude is only one chapter. It's verse 9 and 10. It says that... Uh, Michael, when he withstood Satan over the, for the body of Moses, he didn't uh, try to use his own uh, strength and power. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And he won. And that's the same for you and me, friend. He laughs when you and I think that uh, we can come against him. We cannot. Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. And here's, here's the... Um, the other thing is, is that... Uh, uh, we have the 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58 says this, Thanks be unto God who, who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says, Be filled with the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the, of the flesh. Okay, um, so we read that, right? Oh, in verse 20, and in closing I said, And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So there's a, there's a fight after that in Greece. Don't you know there's a fight going on in Afghanistan right now? Don't you know there's a fight going on in the Middle East? Don't you know there's a fight going on where our missionary, I'm not going to mention her name because we're on YouTube, is there with the gospel of Christ? Don't you know that those who come up against her are not flesh and blood, but they are princip principalities and power, spiritual wickedness in high places? And so each of us needs to be aware of this and, and we need to uh, put on the whole armor of God. And finally here, I, I said, there's a, like I said, a demon associated with the Prince of Peace. 
of the Prince of Greece and he's going after them. Well, that's the picture that we have here, that uh, we have this dragon and listen, if he can come against Christ, he can come against us. He can come against us. But uh, again, submit yourself to the fort of God, resist the devil, he will flee from you, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. And, and in verse 4 of Psalm chapter 23, though I walk through the actual valley of the shadow of death, I, I what do I have to fear? Why? Because God is with me. Yeah, but Satan might come against you. So what? I've got a rod and I've got a staff. They're gods. They're there. And no one can get past his rod. You know who's holding that rod? He is. He says, fear not because I am with you. Be not dismayed because I am thy God. So when the powers of hell come against us, the good news for us is, is that God has put his mantle of protection around about us. And if we confess our sins and start up in the middle of the day, he allows us to put on the spiritual armor apart from which we can do nothing. And it's, we're a joke. And that uh, we can then, at the end of that passage in Ephesians chapter 6, says, that having done all to stand. Now what? Stand. stand. You got your shield ready? You got your sword ready? Spiritual. It's not memorizing the verses. It's not knowing the verses. It's confessing your sin, being right with God, and the Holy Spirit fills you. Satan cannot come against you. None of his demons can come against you. It is him, Christ in us, that gives us the victory. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for this passage here. As we see through history, Satan's uh, uh, his uh, time that he's uh, spent trying to take over planet Earth. But you have shielded us with your... Uh, with your grace, with your mercy, with your presence. And so help us to walk in the Spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will not. And so, gracious Father, forgive me of my sins and help me that I might live for you and I love you and I praise you and ask your blessing uh, this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.